you very welcome to, to all of you. Uh, I'm uh, Martin Smedivak and I'm the president of um, Animal Safe Sweden. And uh, now it's my great privilege to uh, welcome uh, Jonathan Malcolm. Uh, it's wonderful to have this talk and especially since uh, you have uh, your book coming out in just a week. Uh, Superfly, the unexpected uh, lives of the world's most successful insects. It's coming out worldwide the 25th of uh, May. Uh, and I know you can get it in, oh, I think, almost every internet bookshop, at least. And Jonathan, you're an author, uh, you're a vegan, and you're an ethologist. Uh, and the last part means that uh, you study the behavior of animals. And I also know that uh, you're based in Ontario, Canada, where you enjoy biking and also observing animals in your backyard. <laughs> and, Very uh, much so. Yeah. <laughs> And in your other books, you have written quite a few books, some bestsellers I've seen. Then you deal with much bigger animals, um, but insects are very small, and, and, but they are varied and they are very many. And I, I've uh, done a bit of research myself, and you will have to correct me, Jonathan, if I'm wrong, but I've read that there are about one million kinds of insect species that we know of. And this is about 80% of all the world's species. Uh, and many experts believe that there are many more uh, insect species that we don't know about. Um, but there are also great many individual insects. So at any time, uh, there are 10 qua quintillion individual insects alive. And a quintillion is a one with 19 zeros after it. And that makes about 1 billion insects for every human uh, being on earth. Uh, that, that's quite astonishing, astonishing um, numbers. So uh, for me, uh, such a big number, it uh, should make us interested, interested in um, researching and who, who these uh, creatures are. But my first question is, how much uh, of um, research uh, in the ethology of insects uh, has there been done? Jonathan? Yeah, I'm glad you, you specified ethology because if we were just gonna say how much research on insects, uh, as part of my research for my book, I, I discovered that over 100,000 papers, scientific articles have been published on just one species, the fruit fly. Of course, that happens to be perhaps the most popular animal in laboratory research, particularly genetic research. And um, there, of this, there's been a seven Nobel Prizes rewarded to researchers who've worked closely with uh, fruit flies, including the latest one uh, the, for medicine uh, just a few months ago announced to the American and the French women uh, who worked on fruit flies to develop the gene editing technique called called CRISPR-Cas9. So they've been very important for that. As for ethology though, specifically, some of those studies would be regarded as, as behavioral work, but uh, based on go having gone to an ethology conference in Vancouver a couple of years ago, just extrapolating from that, I'm guessing that there may be some number of thousands, possibly 10,000 uh, insect ethologists worldwide. Maybe it's more than that, but it would be not huge numbers, uh, maybe maybe in the thousands, I would guess. Right. And uh, yeah, as we have said, in, in, in this new book, you focus mostly on flies, but also other insects. Um, and um, as you said, fruit flies uh, is very studied. And I've, I've read in, I've got one chapter from your fantastic book. And you mentioned there that um, they have discovered that uh, fr fruit flies have distinct personalities. Can you say something about that and maybe some other aspects of, um, of insects that you discovered? Sure, there's so many things to say about insects. They're so fascinating and we only know a tiny bit of what they do. And by the way, the, the 1 million odd species we've described of insects is probably a small fraction of the total. It's estimated that of the 160,000 species of flies, there are probably five times that many that have not been discovered. People go to the tropics and they catch them in nets and they look at them under a microscope and 90 to 95, sometimes 100% of that sample undescribed, never been seen before. So there's an incredible diversity 
of these animals. As for as for personalities, um, not many people have tested personalities in, in insects. It's, it says a lot about science's curiosity that now scientists would actually think of doing that and that that would be considered a legitimate pursuit as it should be. But I can tell you a generation ago, the idea of studying personalities in insects, people would have said that's crazy, you know. But in fact, uh, you know, evolution works by natural selection and selection implies that you have to have different different uh, individuals to choose from, to select from. So perhaps it shouldn't surprise us that uh, when people do look for personality in animals like, like any, pick your animal, including invertebrate animals like oct octopuses and snails and in insects of, ver of various sorts, they find lo and behold that individuals tend to have different ways of responding to things in their environment and that they stay much the same over time. So one fly who likes to be in a, a brightly lit area and another fly that likes to be lit in a dim area. I use that example because that's the example I know from a, a study that was published a few years ago. Uh, when you test them a week later, the one who was attracted to light last week still is attracted to light. And the one who was attracted to the dark isn't attracted to light, it remains attracted to the dark. So uh, that's sort of the basic way of sort of testing for personality. You know, I know the word personality has the word person in it, and one can debate for a long time about whether personhood is something that insects have. Uh, an interesting question. It implies, uh, you know, consciousness, uh, an experienced life. Um, so it's too bad we can't ask them and they can't tell us in in, in Swedish or, or English or what, whatever language how they're, how they're feeling. That's part of the, the struggle with doing this stuff. But uh, certainly there is some preliminary evidence for personalities in flies. And I think that's, that's not, that shouldn't really surprise us. Um, another interesting aspect of flies that I think intrigues us because it's so like ourselves is that uh, flies, male flies who've been rejected by females tend to gravitate more towards alcohol. They're more likely to drink a source of alcohol than non-rejected males. How very human of them, uh, whether that means they're experiencing the same kind of rejection syndrome that, that a rejected or rebuffed male, may male human may feel, that's open to debate. Fruit flies also intelligently uh, tend to favor alcohol if they know that there are parasitic wasps in, in their midst who may try to uh, lay an egg in them, which will develop into a little wasp larva that will grow inside and kill the fly or kill the, the maggot. So that they, they, they selectively gravitate towards alcohol if there is the threat of a parasite. I find that interesting, flexible behavior. The question is, in this case, an interesting question is, how does this big fly uh, land on a human and, and get her larva to go inside the human's host or whatever the animal is? And the answer is they never do touch the host. They, they never make contact they to do the dirty work for them. So a bot fly will wait perched nearby and hopefully a mosquito, hopefully a female mosquito will fly by. The bot fly flies out, grabs the mosquito, lays an egg on the mosquito, and then lets the mosquito go. So it's like, go and do your work now. So, and that little, that little egg hatches and there's a tiny, tiny larva. And if that mosquito happens to land on a human or a horse or whatever host they may feed from and successfully feeds on them and then leaves, while, while the mosquito is feeding, the little larva crawls down the mosquito's proboscis and waits for the mosquito to leave and then quickly climbs into the hole left by the mosquito. And that's the entrance hole. Uh, you know, I, I, I can see a couple people shaking their heads with amazement. I mean, it amazes me too, that level of sophistication of planning. When I say planning, I don't mean to necessarily imply cognition, although we shouldn't rule that out. And I'm happy to talk about anim uh, insect minds. But um, the sophistication of that behavior and how that evolves over time, uh, these are some of the things that really fascinate me about ethology and, and insect ethology. There's many other things I could mention, but uh, we have limited time, so. Right, right. And people can always uh, read the book uh, also when it comes out. I want to move on to um, uh, other questions like we as an animal rights organization, we are, of course, uh, interested in, um, in uh, different animals and especially if we can reduce suffering in, in, in a way for animals. Um, but uh, to find out how much an individual uh, suffers, it's important to investigate both their capacity to feel pain, but also their um, degree of consciousness, um, if I understood it right. Can you explain why that is these two um, uh, things? 
Yeah, this gets into that word sentience that was mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, sentience, capacity to feel, the capacity in particular to feel painful or negative events and the capacity to feel positive and perhaps all, all the in between. And some of these experiences might be physical, some might be emotional. It's a broad array of things. So it's a very broad term. But notice I use the word experiences. And that's a critical word here because to be sentient implies that you have some level of consciousness, some degree of awareness, some degree of presence, some degree of existence in the experiential sense that you feel things. So that's a very important criterion. And it's one that we, we've had a, a very checkered past. Humans, they tended to deny sentience to other animals. The low point probably was with Descartes in the 17th century who argued that animals, meaning non-human animals, we of course are biologically animals as well. But he said animals are nothing more than machines, uh, automatons, they have no feelings, so they're of no moral consequence. And unfortunately that idea has carried through even to the current era where a lot of people will still argue that for instance, fishes don't have a sense of pain, even though there's now very, very rigorous science to, to, to refute that, to show that they actually do have that. So consciousness, awareness, sentience, really, really important constructs for any question of whether these animals uh, are uh, worthy of our ethical consideration and concern. And we, we typically treat them as if they're not. Uh, but there's a, some in, intriguing research coming out suggesting that insects can feel pain. Their experience of pain may be different than ours. It may, may be different parts of their body in different contexts. So for instance, uh, a locust or a praying mantis for that matter, who's mating, um, perhaps, perhaps the praying mantis, the male, if he gets eaten by the female, which is a good way to nourish his own, his own eggs, his own young, his own offspring, maybe he doesn't feel pain in that situation. Uh, I kind of hope so for his sake. Uh, so we need to be open to different ways that sentience is expressed and experienced. But do we then say that insects don't feel pain or anything, not according to studies that show, uh, including a fairly recent study where they amputated one leg from an insect and then tested the insect uh, weeks later on a, in a situation to see whether there was a neural response to uh, a pain-like response. I don't remember the exact method they used, but they found that three weeks after injury, that insect, in this case, I think it was flies, were showing a painful response that ones who were not injured were not showing. Uh, and they used various methods of, of, of causing them to feel pain, assuming they feel pain. So that's just one example of a study that um, makes us scratch our heads and say, well, maybe we need to be open to the idea these animals are sentient and they, that they feel. Certainly being able to feel a negative thing, pain, is very useful to an animal who can move. If, if you're a plant, the, the main argument for why plants probably didn't evolve uh, pain or sentience, which is not that we should disrespect them. I think we need, we obviously need plants and we should respect them too. Um, but the main argument is that they can't move away from a painful stimulus. They can't literally walk away, whereas an insect can move away. Uh, there may be exceptions to this where being able to, being mobile doesn't maybe maybe compute because you don't have enough brain power but but insects have hundreds of a couple of hundred thousand neurons you you've got more neural connections there than there are grains of sand on earth so there's still huge potential for complex cognition complex behavior complex sentience maybe that was a little long-winded but i think i think it's a really important topic to discuss yeah absolutely but is there any way to say uh if we know that insects can feel pain, and of course it could also be a spectrum of how much they can feel, like if you compare to humans, is there any way to feel, if we feel a 10, what, what would they feel in a one to 10 spectrum? To be blunt, no, there isn't a way. Uh, we, can, we can design experiments that maybe try to measure the degree and, and that's, that's useful, but the, the the problem here and the big challenge is that we cannot get inside the body and the experiences of another individual. We can't do it with other humans. We happen to have speech uh, languages that we can report how we're feeling and we can relate that to someone else feeling that way when they've been in that situation. If they've had a hangover, say, or if they've stubbed a toe or, or heaven forbid, had a, lost a finger or something, 
uh, by reporting the experience of the pain. But even then, there's a lot of evidence that individual humans experience pain very differently in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So it's very complicated. So trying to extrapolate from a human to a non-human, uh, in particular, say an insect, which is, re they're related to us. We have a common ancestor, but it's way, way, way a long time ago, you know, hundreds of millions of years that we have a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to try to make those kinds of of, of specific comparisons. What we can do is we can observe animals in situations that might be painful for them. Uh, we can we can use technologies or simple observation to see how they are responding behaviorally, biochemically. Consider that insects have um, where is it here? They have they have uh, octopamine and dopamine systems. They have biochemicals in their bodies that have obviously been around in animals' bodies for hundreds of millions of years because they show remarkable parallels to, to us. I mentioned the alcohol response for male, rejected male flies earlier. Um, so there's remarkable parallels and that helps to inform our view of whether or not they might feel pain and, and to what degree they might feel pain. I've always been an exponent of the uh, so-called precautionary principle where there's doubt, reasonable doubt, give them the benefit of the doubt because they got more to lose. If they, if they do feel pain, then uh, you know, we, we should be mindful of not causing them pain. I'm thinking about uh, one experiment about fish, and I think uh, you write about this in uh, what, your book, What a Fish Knows, um, where you have, I think it was salmon, uh, and you inject them with a painful um, thing, and then you see if they go for the morphine that you have uh, put out, and if they do go, go for that and, and try to numb themselves then from the pain, then um, people uh, or researchers uh, say that this is evidence as good as, as it gets that um, they feel pain. Um, and you talked about other examples, but has, has something similar been done on, on insects? Or? It has, and it is a, is a very clever technique is to subject animals to a presumably painful situation. This has been done with pigs, with chickens, with rats, with many other animals who are unfortunate enough to end up in scientific laboratories and be subjected to these experiments. And you give, say, rats or chickens after they've been made lame uh, by an injection of a caustic substance, what have you, you give them the choice between uh, water this regular unadulterated water or, or a, a water feeder that's the same that is it got a, a painkiller dissolved in it and, and during the few days following the insult following the injury they will stop drinking unadulterated water and they will drink from the uh, painkiller water even though the painkiller water tastes bitter so they're willing to pay a cost to get pain relief. And then as the days progress and they get better, just like we would do, they go off the drug, they, they go back to unadulterated water. I think that that's a very compelling method of demonstrating that. It has been tried in flies and I describe it in the book and I'm trying to remember uh, how that was specifically done. So rather than pick the book up and leaf through it and try and find it, I, I can tell you that it was a, an unimpressive result. Um, they, they, I think the ones who had been subjected to pain, they didn't, they didn't go and, and take more painkiller per se. I think they consumed more of everything. So, so the, the, the question is very much open. And the question may ultimately always remain open as to whether insects can feel pain. But I think we can become more, more or less certain that they do. And I would argue that it's likely that we're going to become more certain that they do. Right. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons why we organize this talk um, uh, with uh, Animal Save Sweden is that we started a, a new group called uh, Be Save Sweden and joining other big groups in the global save movement. Um, so since we are quite new to um, this topic of bees, we uh, obviously want to know more about uh, bees and I know that bees are not your main focus in the book. Um, but I, I, I saw that you wrote a little bit about bees. Uh, so for instance, you um, wrote something about how they communicate and how they can recognize even human faces. Uh, so I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about uh, bees. 
Well, thank goodness for bees for so many reasons. For one thing, them, them being hugely important pollinators, although I want to add that flies rank second to bees as the most important uh, pollinating insects and pollinating creatures in the world. Um, it's estimated that the commercial value of insect pollination every year for humans, because we like to measure things in dollars, uh, is uh, over half a trillion dollars the value of that. So that's not to be underestimated. Um, yeah, bees are, are great also because they overturn and they've caused us to have to rethink our assumptions. They're just insects. They can't think, they can't do this, they don't feel pain. You know, all these assumptions we make that tend to be negative and denying. Uh, lo and behold, you know, uh, um, can't remember his name now, the guy, uh, uh, the Carl von Frisch, who shared the Nobel Prize in 1972 for ethology, his major contribution to study of animal behavior was the discovery, I say discovery in quotes because the bees, of course, had discovered it a long time ago, that bees communicate with symbolic language, that they have this waggle dance, and I'm sure most people here, because you're probably interested in animals, know about this, but the, the a bee comes back from foraging out in the fields and gets in the hive and if he not he sorry if she has found a very good source of flowers with lots of nectar she does a very excited intense waggle dance and the intensity of the dance is a measure of how good the food source is how worth it is to go there the duration of the dance conveys information about the distance and the angle of the body relative to gravity it gives information about the angle to go relative to the sun. And if it's a long dance, the angle of the dance changes to match the migration of the sun across the sky as the earth rotates. Uh, it's incredibly sophisticated. It's, it's a true language because it's uh, symbolic of something that it's conveying information about something that's in a separate time and place. Um, and more and more discoveries about that have been have taken place over the decades, the ensuing decades since its discovery. There's tons of very interesting papers published about this. So certainly honeybees, because of this remarkable communication system that, that they've evolved, uh, really overturn, as I say, a lot of old assumptions we've had about them. Uh, but the, but bees do other stuff too. So human face recognition, I think you mentioned that. That's fairly simply studied. I don't remember the specific method that was used for honeybees, but you can present them with pictures of human faces as they've done with fishes as well to show that they, they the fish or the bee uh, learns to recognize a familiar face and will select that if they get a food reward. That's the usual method that's done. Um, what else did I want to mention about, about honeybees? Uh, a concept of zero. They have a concept of zero, which is considered a pretty a uh, smart thing to have. Uh, the, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult concept for us to learn as humans when we're children to learn the concept of zero. You know, one, two, three, four, five is fine, but zero, the idea of a zero. Uh, and how do you test that on a bee? Well, the way I can remember the method they use there, they train bees to select one of two pieces of paper with, with fewer black dots. So if you have a piece of paper here with two black dots and one here with say four black dots, uh, the bee gets a reward for flying to this one and, and choosing that one. And then after training them that, so they, they had bees who always preferred the smaller number, then they presented them with, for instance, two dots here and zero dots here. So there's no dot at all on the page. That's a very different situation than one or two dots. And yet the, fly, the bees were able to sort of extrapolate from their earlier learnings that, z that no dots is less than two dots. And they would once again fly to that panel and whatever they had to do to get their food reward. So I think that's pretty impressive as well. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised given that they're, these are creatures that have this complex communication system. And by the way, and I write a bit about this, about insect brains, and I show a picture of, a, of an insect brain. Uh, I actually have it here. Why don't I just show you? I think I can find it pretty fast. It's just about one fifth of a fly's brain. Look at how complex that that is. Those are the neurons. That's about 250. That's about uh, let's see, 25,000 neurons. So that's the about um, maybe one eighth of the whole number of neurons in the brain of a fruit fly. Uh, it's a complex brain. It's way smaller than ours. Uh, maybe a millionth the number of neurons that we have, but they can do a lot with those brains. Um, another thing that's been found is observational learning in bumblebees. Bumblebees, I remember going to a lecture when I was an undergrad a graduate student many, many years ago, and the guy talked about how bumblebees are very good at remembering which flowers they visited, and they don't repeat, because if you go back to the same flower you were just at a minute ago, there's not going to be any nectar there. It takes a while for the nectar 
nectaries to, to replenish the nectar, which is what the plant, how the plant rewards the bee for doing the right thing, which is coming and taking my nectar and therefore getting pollen on you and moving the pollen from one plant to another. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful mutualism in, in nature. And they found that you can watch YouTube videos of a lot of this stuff, by the way, that bumblebees who can watch another bumblebee who has learned through trial and error and training to pull a string, to, to pull a, a disc out from a, a cover that it can't get at, and then pull the disc out that has food in the middle and eat the food. Uh, bumblebees who've seen other ones do that learn to do it much faster than ones who haven't had the benefit of observing that. That's called observational learning. And that's, again, a pretty impressive high level cognitive skill. So those, those are just some examples of what uh, bees, honeybees and bumblebees uh, are able to do with their minds. Yeah, really interesting. And as an animal rights organization, of course, we want to focus, uh, as we do with other animals, on how they are exploited. And, and if we as humans um, bring any suffering and maybe killing to, to them. So of course, the honey industry is uh, such an example. But I've also learned recently about um, the commercial pollinating industry. And, and, and that's a big business um, where they take uh, both honeybees and bumblebees and um, export them to um, different places where they're needed for pollination. Like uh, I know almonds in California is a big thing and they, they need uh, so much pollination for doing that. Um, only uh, yeah, three million colonies of honeybees were reported as uh, commercial pollinators in the U.S. alone uh, last year. I read. Can you say something about how bees uh, are affected, um, honeybees and bumblebees, uh, uh, when we humans use them like this? Uh, are they suffering because of this? Uh, like when we take their honey, or I know uh, also beekeepers uh, smoke them. Uh, to get them like passive when they open the hive. Do you know uh, things like this? And what does it mean for the bees? Yeah, it's an important question. I, I have to say off the bat that I don't have a lot of expertise in that area. My, my intention was to do some reading and research before this interview, and I, I, I haven't gotten to that. Uh, however, I can say a few general things such as uh, whenever he, uh, humans use animals for profit, for money, for commerce, uh, you can bet your life that things are not gonna be ideal for the animals and uh, the use of bees commercially is no exception. Um, does that mean that all, all human use of bees, all beekeeping is bad? I, I would not say that. I think that there can be, if somebody is compassionate and uh, respectful of the bees, that it can be a, a good mutualistic, uh, mutually beneficial arrangement. I don't think the bees need us. They'll do just fine without us. Thank you very much. Um, but if we do try to use them, then we should uh, treat them with, with respect and make sure they have enough food and help them out provide them with more flowers. Uh, but, and as you say, you know, moving them long distances is probably quite bewildering for them. Uh, no pun intended, they're bewildering. And uh, um, smoking them is probably not fun for them. I've seen some, I did see a video on some of the ills of beekeeping and I saw bees being squashed and like deliberately mm -hmm. to, to test for their, for their honey content and this sort of thing. You know, bees don't make honey for us, they make it for themselves. So we should be mindful of that. And, and a bit more respectful than we are. So yeah, there's definitely concerns about about that. And and I don't I don't know why what's causing the the honeybee colony collapse disorder that we hear about um, that that's that's causing bee populations to decline. But I can tell you that using pesticides, we're addicted to pesticides, is one of the problems. In this very building I'm in now, which is a condo unit with eight units, condominiums, uh, I successfully. Uh, can't ask them to not use the, the spraying of spiders last year. And they, they say, they call it sp spider spraying, but really this is a broad spectrum pesticide that kills uh, bees, uh, beetles, other animals on contact. First of all, spiders are great. We should, we should welcome them rather than try to get rid of them. And uh, this, but this, uh, this year, you know, I was overruled and they went ahead with a, with a application of pesticides a few days ago. And it just, it's just a shame because we need to get out of that. We need to stop poisoning the planet. It's not good for us. It's not good for anyone. So, uh, you know, I could say more, more about that, but um, certainly beekeeping and pesticide use uh, have a lot of problems with them. Uh, another thing about pollination, I mean, 
uh, it's obvious for most of us that uh, poll we need pollination. I mean, otherwise uh, there would be so much food that we couldn't uh, get. And that, and that goes for both the humans and uh, other animals, right? Uh, who needs the food of free things. Um, and, and I know, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've read and, and saw some documentaries about the problem with the, uh, the collapse. Um, but the situation we are in right now, can we do with, let's say for instance, that everyone stopped uh, with pollinate businesses uh, like this commercial pollination everyone stopped uh, eating honey so there wouldn't be uh, like any farming of, of bees would we still have uh, enough bees to, to pollinate is that possible do you think i don't know maybe we'd have a few less almonds for a few years but uh, monocrops monocultures where we have huge swaths of land growing just one crop wheat soybeans almonds you know you name it uh, that's another problem because uh, it's it's very difficult for most animals to survive there. They need a, a varied environment. And, uh, but also a particular species who does eat that food is gonna have a, a, a festival. You know, they're gonna do great because it's their favorite food. And so what do we do? We, we poison them, we, we put pesticides on those. I, I, I make a brief in the book about uh, the need for um, integrated farming where we have different crops grown together. If you would give just maybe one or two advices for for this uh, bee group that we now have, uh, what, what what would be the most important things for us to do for the bees? Uh, do you have any? Yeah, yeah a few things that I, I, I like to mention. Uh, bigger nature reserves, we need more natural land. They need more space. I, I was shocked while I was researching my book to discover that it's estimated now that the total numbers of vertebrate animals, the diversity of vertebrate animals, the, the, the count of individuals on, on the planet, about 60% of them are livestock, so-called livestock, meaning animals we're raising to eat. About the 30% are humans, and about that leaves about 4% total of all the others, all the wild, all wildlife, all the wild creatures. So we've really, it's truly a measure of the Anthropocene that we're in. You know, we've domesticated the world. We've mm -hmm. We've taken animals captive in huge numbers. Um, so, and I think, I, I don't know if that includes marine animals. Um, that's a whole problem in itself, but uh, certainly aquaculture, which is the farming of fishes is, has been increasing and growing a great deal. So, so one of the things we can do is to, um, where are my notes here on this? Yeah, to, to build more nature reserves. Stop using pesticides is another one. Uh, we, I've already talked about that. Um, lawns, converting lawns to natural gardens. There is a movement to do that, and it, but it's very tiny. You know, when I look around here in Belleville, Ontario, I see lawns, I see grass, just grass. I see quite a lot of dandelions. I'm happy to see that. But, you know, if people plant natural plants who, which evolved in this area, it's so much better for the local wildlife and including the insect life. So that's another way people can help is to get rid of your lawn and make a garden instead and plant natural, natural plants that are native to your area, uh, including invertebrates in conservation efforts. It's almost all about the big charismatic ones. It's great. We need conservation efforts. We need to protect wolves. We need to protect, protect deer and bison, etc. But we also need to protect the little ones. We need to make sure they have places to live and that they can do their vital job to help run this planet. Um, one or two more things, examples I wanted to mention. Um, eating lower on the food chain. Um, being plant-based with your eating habits is one of the best things you can do, if not the best thing you can do as an individual for the planet. Uh, you help biodiversity. Why do you help biodiversity? Well, because about 83% of the land we use for farming is used in animal agriculture, either for growing animals directly or for growing grains or foods to feed the animals that we then eat. It's terribly inefficient. And that makes up about 18% of the calories that we consume. So we use 83% of the farming land to generate 18% of the calories. That's a terribly inefficient, wasteful way to make food. I'm encouraged and excited about the rise of plant-based meats that are coming up because people aren't just going to give up meat. They love their meat. Humans love their meat. Uh, so you, you can't just expect people to stop eating it, even though you can ask them to. Uh, more convincing is if they have a good alternative. And these alternatives, which are increasingly available in, in area restaurants here, and I know that Sweden is a, is a country that has more and more choices as well. I'm, I'm excited about that. It can't happen soon enough. 
Uh, and then, of course, there is the lab grown or in vitro or clean meat, uh, where you're actually eating the animal's tissues, but you never had to grow an, an, a sentient being, an animal, to make that. So those two technologies, which are now being invested into the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions now, uh, and there are rapidly growing food sectors, nevertheless, in this huge planet with large swaths, if particularly of Southeast Asia, where there's huge populations who are trying to catch up and trying to westernize their diets, uh, meat consumption is still going up for that reason. I'm, I'm hoping for the day when it levels off and starts going down. Uh, we haven't quite got there yet. So those are some of the things we can do to help insects. Very good. Would you also see us uh, not eating honey? <laughs> Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I think we, if, if somebody wants to eat honey, then I would say uh, find out about the manufacturer, Are they a big commercial manu grower, then that's probably problematic. If you can find a local apiarist who uh, lets the bees do their thing and w wants to increase their numbers and isn't just in it for a big profit and doesn't use pesticides and doesn't smoke smoke them out, maybe occasional to, to look at the hives, maybe they need to do that, but is very respectful then that might be okay, you know, check your source. It's the same as so-called free range eggs. You know, the definition of free range here in, the, in, in North America is terribly lax. You can have a huge shed with a tiny little opening door at the end with a tiny little, uh, you know, few square meters of land there and uh, call it free range. Uh, or you can have a, a few happy hens who are running around doing their hen like thing. And th that's more like it. So I, I think, uh, some people would find this controversial to say, but I think I think you could eat you could eat eggs in an ethical manner if the chicken is delighted and having a great life, uh, is not upset with having her eggs taken away, which sometimes they can be. So I think we need to be mindful of the situations um, uh, that that we're talking about. So I don't think honey necessarily has to be bad. Uh, most examples probably are bad. I choose not to eat it because I can use uh, agave nectar or, or maple syrup. I can use uh, plant-based sources and taste just as good on, on a, a piece of toast or my pancakes as, as, as honey might, might taste. I don't even remember because it's been a long time since I've had honey. Right. So I, I want to ask you one last question before I let the others in. And it's a more strategic uh, question, more maybe political, but uh, for the animal rights movement, I mean, we, we have uh, our fair share of problems trying to reach people. And I know you talked about this. Uh, and when I interviewed you, you also talked about how, how to reach people to care about fish. Uh, and that's uh, hard in itself. But when we try to get people interested um, to care about insects, that's e way harder, I think. Um, so. Uh, what would you give for advice for the animal rights movement? Should the animal rights movement uh, focus more on insects or is it like too difficult to get people to, to begin to care for them? What do you think? I think my, my blunt answer is no. Uh, I, my mission here with this book is not to get people to, to shift their attention from one group of animals to another, although it needn't be shifting needed. It can be uh, embracing a new group and adding it to what we already have. Uh, but I don't want to interfere with the good campaigns to protect animals who are very clearly sentient, uh, all the vertebrate animals, you know, that, that's clearly the case with them. Mm -hmm. What I do hope to achieve with the writing about insects is to make us think more about them, make us realize that uh, we are utterly dependent on them. Uh, insects would fare quite well, they would do pretty good if we all disappeared, but the opposite is definitely not true. We would we'd be gone. We would, we would the whole ecosystem would collapse without that 80% of species that make up insects. They're just too important. There's they're, they're too much in, in an integral part of ecosystems. So we cannot live without them. We have to have them. And that's you know, a humble message that humans need to embrace. Uh, we don't run the show. Look at COVID. We, we don't run the show. We're not in control here. Uh, we can only run roughshod over at nature for so long before it catches up with us. And we're, we're seeing signs of that as we see deterioration of ecosystems, biodiversity loss, uh, you know, pollution issues and, and, and zoonoses like COVID. Uh, it's not the first one we've had uh, and it probably unfortunately won't be the last. As long as we're having wet markets and eating animals, uh, we're opening up uh, the, um, the opportunity for these diseases to flourish and to spread easily. They're opportunistic. So uh, not to end on a negative note, I think to the, to the extent that we can embrace and recognize the importance of insects, even if it's not as individuals, although I welcome that, 
uh, then we're going to have a better chance at a livable planet in the future. And whether we do it or not, you know, a million years after the last human treads on the on the earth, there'll be a fly sitting on a leaf somewhere, happily preening her antennae because they're going to be around for a long time. They're very nimble, they're very adaptable, and, and they're very successful. Thank you. So now I want to open up to every one of you who is uh, here. Uh, uh, in the last thing you said about uh, if Martin uh, asked about uh, if the animals save uh, would um, uh, uh, would add more uh, about the insects and do more for, for them. I, your answer, uh, I understood it like you thought it was not uh, that important, uh, or did I misunderstood that? Or, or thanks for asking that. that. Matilda, uh, let me try and clarify. Uh, I hope I didn't say it's not not that important. Uh, I, I didn't mean to imply that. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, we we need a we need a different ethic to do with all animals. We need to stop thinking we're at the top of the pyramid that we're the best. We're just different. We do wonderful things: technology, art, music, language. I mean, fantastic things that we have achieved. And I'm sorry that I sometimes speak very fast. I should try to be a bit slower with a non. English first language audience, um, but but I, I certainly don't mean to suggest that um, that insects uh, shouldn't be part of our ethic of concern and respect and protection of the environment because they're so important ecologically. That's reason enough that we should embrace them. But I do think it's important we do think of them as also potentially sentient. And uh, again, where there's doubt, and there's plenty of doubt, we should give them the benefit of the doubt. And the science is showing already that it looks like they're, they're not lacking in experience, that they do actually experience something. And that means we should be very concerned about them, not just as ec ecological components, not just as species, but also even as individuals. So it is part of the message here is to have a bro broader ethics that is more inclusive, that to expands to include other groups of animals that we've up to now mostly excluded. I got some questions here on the chat. And Susan Dutry, she asks, uh, can we hear more about flies sentence, uh, sentience, I guess? Uh, yeah, that, I'm glad. Thanks, Susan, for asking that. Um, there was one thing I wanted to mention about their, about, flies that I thought was really interesting, and that is that they have an attention span. I remember reading about that some years ago. Uh, scientists in Australia have devised an, a way to see if a fly has an attention span, if they become preoccupied with something. Uh, and lo and behold, they do. They fit the criteria. So what they did was they, I have a nice picture of this, but not. I don't have it available, but uh, it, they made a drum, a rotating drum, and they had a fly suspended who could fly and look and see the drum and the drum would have a symbol on it like an X uh, or X or, or a plus sign. And when this plus sign rotated around where the fly could see it, unfortunately the fly has electrodes in the brain so it's not very fly, fly friendly study. The electrodes start firing, the brain becomes more active, it sees this, this shape come by and it comes by again and again, the, 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 the neurons are, are buzzing with activity. But as it keeps going by the same symbol uh, the, 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 the response comes down. Uh, it's sort of like the flies getting bored with the same thing. And then if they suddenly change to a circle or another symbol, up go the neurons again. It's a new stimulus. So one of the hallmarks of attention is that attention wanes if you, get, if you don't get anything new into your environment. And then another hallmark of attention, of attention is that you're distracted from or you're not as easily distracted. If I'm, if I'm speaking to you and uh, something's going on in the other room, I'm probably not going to be very well attentive to that. Whereas if I'm, if I stop and I'm relaxing, then I'll be more attentive to that. And the same thing with flies. So if a fly is 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 paying attention to some new shape, so the, the, it's like the brain is is um, kind of preoccupied or occupied with this stimulus. So those of what we call attention span, having an attention span. And we know that we have it, and so do flies. There's probably some other neuro cognition stuff I could talk about. But oh, yeah, let me just give one more example quickly. Um, uh, well, there's a couple of examples rational decision making, uh, 
female fruit flies will copy the preferences of another female for a given male, even if he's not a very successful male, they can set it up in an artificial situation. And female flies tend to be, I'll have what she's having, tend to be more uh, attracted to a male who they know another female is attracted to. Oh, this, ma female, this male must have good qualities and they, they respond to that. Uh, transitive logic, if, if one fly can watch two male flies having a battle because they will fight for, with each other to try and uh, get rights to court a female and fly A beats fly B and then this fly sees that fly B beats fly C, the fly who watches that knows that fly A is probably also going to beat fly C. It's a simple transitive logic. So A is greater than B, B is greater than C. Flies then f know that A is usually going to be greater than C. So those are just a couple of other examples of where scientists have te test tested these kinds of forms of cognition and found that flies have it. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I have a question for Muriel Gouli. Yes, thank you. Hi, Jonathan. Um, in the Hi, course Bernie. of researching uh, your new book, what um, aspects uh, did you learn about flies that amazed you the most that you didn't know of? Mm, that's a great question and it, it's sort of like there's so many let me just turn to my notes and see if any jump out because there's one of the joys of this book was of researching this book was was the discovery of all the amazing things that flies do some of them are grim uh some of them are, are fun and exciting. One of my favorites was, was the relationship between certain flowers that manipulate flies to, as pollinators. And, and it's almost like a, a scary riot at an amusement park. There's fly, flowers that invite the fly in and then it has a slippery surface so the fly falls in and then the, the plant closes the door, the flower closes the door to trap the fly in there and then violently stamps the fly with it with with a pollen with a polonium or a pollen containing thing maybe on the head or on a shoulder and then the fly and then maybe an hour later after giving some food and drink to the fly uh, the plant will release the fly and let the fly fly off and hopefully go to another one of the same species where that pollen grains will be transferred to that and then they get stamped again they can go to different flowers because if 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 the different flowers stamp them with pollen on different parts of the body then the contact will be made and it won't it won't ruin it for the other flower so that was one of the more fun things to to learn and, and write about is is how these flies experience some of these very fly adapted um, flowers uh, just a couple of things I haven't mentioned and there's whole chapters devoted to this because it's really interesting and important uh, flies are very useful as wound healers not so much the flies but the maggots uh, maggots they their movements help to help to clean wounds. They eat only necrotic tissue, only tissue that's dead or dying uh, or infected. Uh, they have natural disinfectants. So they, they're, they have become and are still used very widely for healing some very intractable wounds, wounds that are very difficult to, to get rid of, such as bed sores and diabetic ulcers and this sort of thing. Um, and they're also very important in crime solving because flies are attracted to dead human bodies very quickly. They arrive on the scene. Uh, they give very good clues as to the time of death, the approximate time of death of somebody. And they've led to hundreds of murder convictions and quite a few exonerations, people who were thought to be and who were convicted of a crime that they didn't commit. And the fly evidence, the maggot evidence, uh, is, is able to show that they actually were not there at the time of the death. So there's just a couple of other areas of interest. I, I hope that interests you as much as it does me. Thank you. I, I got another question on the chat from Lena. Um, she, she talks about uh, if it's vegan food, shouldn't it be also organic? Uh, and I guess um, yeah, because we're polluting, uh, so she, she says we're polluting so much. And as, as you say, that's one of the reasons uh, why so many of the in insects die. How do you feel about that? Absolutely, uh, we should all try to to acquire organic food uh, and support organic grower, growers if we can. Uh, we certainly have that choice here where I live in most supermarkets. And I, if I have an organic choice, I almost always purchase that choice. It's another way of voting with our, with our wallets and not giving money to people who use chemicals or use harmful pesticides or herbicides. Mm. Yeah, I'm all for that. Here in Sweden, I don't know how it is in other countries, but if it's organic, you can't use um, uh, chemical fertilizers. You have to use um, um, 
manure from animals. And so that has been a, like a discussion. I, I think many, most vegans think that, I mean, that's okay because you can't really avoid it. But uh, of course, that's, that's one part where you use uh, animals in, in a way. Yeah, that speaks to a movement I've heard of called veganic farming, where you don't have any animal products, including as fertilizer. And uh, you know, one of the problems with using animal manure is you can get cross-contamination and you can get E. coli, uh, which sometimes is in the news, it's associated with, with tomatoes or lettuce or spinach. Uh, e. coli is named for the colon, the lower intestine, where feces are produced in animals and spinaches and tomatoes don't have colons. They don't produce this, this, this pathogens, these pathogens. Uh, so the, the, sometimes the plants, the vegetables get a bad rap that really should be going to the animal growers. Right. Okay, maybe we have time for one or two questions. Uh, there is one from Inge Taylor. How do you distinguish between cognition and sentience when talking about insects? Are they interwoven? Uh, that this distinguishing is difficult. Yeah, they're definitely interwoven. Uh, cognition is the ability to process in things mentally. So that's a sort of a, 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 a phenomenon that you have to be sentient to be able to do, sentient to be able to do. And a sentience is the capacity to feel. So a cognitive animal is, is definitely by definition sentient. A sentient animal could theoretically be not be cognitive uh, and say just emotional, so, but, but, but not likely. Uh, if, if one tends to go with the other. So if you're sentient, you're probably cognitive. And if you're cognitive, you're definitely sentient. sentient. Uh, about eating insects, I've I, I read somewhere that uh, 2 billion people are already regularly eating insects. Not so much, I think, in our countries where most of us uh, live, but in other parts of the world. Uh, but that's uh, something they talk about uh, a lot about uh, like farming uh, insects for um, human consumption, but also to uh, feed uh, animals. And that seems to be on the uprise and uh, uh, thinking about how small they are. I mean, that could affect uh, many, many individuals. Uh, is that something you have been thinking about? Yes, I have been thinking about that. And I did, I did write about that research and write about that in uh, one of the latter chapters of my book. Uh, it is concerning. Uh, there, there is a lot of companies springing up who are growing insects, uh, including flies, uh, soldier flies in particular. The larvae, the grubs grow very fast. They're very efficient at, at transferring, converting uh, waste, food waste that we produce lots of. So composters, they're very good composters. They're very efficient in that regard. And they're high fat, high protein. So, you know, a lot of this commercial investigation is about raising them to feed them to livestock. So raising animals to feed animals to feed humans. It's a pattern that we've shown before. And, it, and it's, it's not the most efficient to do. It, it's definitely more efficient than some of the ways that we currently raise livestock. But I'm, I don't, I don't favor it. It's not something I think we need or should be doing um, um, it, it, and on many levels, including the possibility of suffering for the, for the insects who are raised. Um, so I, I, would, I would say it's problematic. And it, it's, as you say, it's definitely a growing industry and one we should be keeping an eye on and maybe be concerned about. I was, I was struck by how the companies who I reached out to for more information were not very forthcoming. And I mentioned that in my book. One last question uh, uh, from um, uh, from the chat. Uh, does your book talk about spiders? Uh, and can you mention something about that? Uh, I don't know if I talk about spiders. I, you know, there's a lot goes in a book and I'm just trying to remember to see if they're in the index. Um, spiders, of course, are not technically yeah, spiders and consciousness. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, a little bit of a mention of jumping spiders in, in the section of the book where I'm talking about the question of cognition, because interesting studies on jumping spiders, these little spiders with eight eyes, and they hop around, they don't really build webs, and hunt uh, other little invertebrates. Uh, studies have shown that they will go behind an object and back away from a prey to find a better angle. Um, so they seem to have object permanence. 
uh, they do some things that are indicative of, of cognition in, in, in a spider. And of course, there's many, many, many species of spiders of another very successful group, even though they're not technically insects, they're closely related. So yes, I do mention spiders briefly. They deserve their own book and maybe somebody's gonna do that soon. Thank you. We're gonna wrap this up. Uh, I wanna ask uh, how you can get your new book and um, yeah, can you yes, mention the title again and where it's available and so on? Uh, sure, the usual channels, uh, online bookstores. That I don't know if there'll be any actual bookstores in, in Sweden that will have, have, it, have it, but it's very easy to find. It, look, it looks like that and uh, it's a paperback, so it's fairly cheap, which is nice. But um, I imagine if you're in Sweden in the modern era, you can order things online. Uh, I don't know of a Swedish translation planned yet, but hopefully in time that will be the case. There, there are Chinese and Japanese translations so far, so hopefully there'll be some more. And I know uh, the audio book is coming the same date as the written one. Yeah, the audio, uh, the ebook and the audio book will, will be available on the, on the same date. And I, I did the reading for the audio book this time. That was a, a first for me. It was an interesting experience. And by the way, I'm reading some of the chat messages. Thank you for the uh, messages uh, from people. I'm sorry that I can't, I haven't just responded to them, but I appreciate what you've said. And where can you find more about your work in general, uh, Jonathan? Uh, people can always go to my website. Nancy, did you want to say something? Hey, Hi, Nancy. I used Hi. to be Jonathan's colleague. I just wanted to say something concerning spiders that you might find entertaining. Bought the train, all gimsy bimsy spins and clay through up and mean man varsvensk. Wow, that's impressive. To somebody I've only ever heard speak English, I see now that the Peterson is a Swedish name, right? Thank you for that. Yeah, that was nice. Swedish, very popular children's song about spiders with universal appeal. Yes, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Jonathan, and thank you all that have been, uh, in, um, been in this talk and uh, contributed and listened. Uh, we look forward to your book, uh, Jonathan, and that has, this has been a good start uh, for uh, learning more about insects, I feel. I think everyone here thinks so. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for organizing it, and thanks to the people who joined us. It was nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks for being friends of animals.